Hello everybody, my name is Stephen Housen and this is today's Warm Down Podcast and as you may well know by now, One Football are supporting me and this channel by sponsoring this video, so please go and check them out, the link is in the description below. On the One Football app you can follow certain clubs if you, you know, just happen to have a bit of a, a thing for a club in another country or something like that, you can find out all their news or maybe you know a couple of players that are playing somewhere and you just want to find out what's happening with them, get them turned on the alerts, get the notifications turned on, get that thing right to your phone anytime something happens. It is literally my number one news source now for anything that's happening in football. Often quicker than Sky Sports and any of the other apps that are out there. Get the alerts on your phone, popping up anytime that you need them. Uh, they've got loads of stats on here. You can use this for your fixture list. You can use this to see what other games are being played all around the place. It's got a great interface, really fast app, loads of top information on there. Get it downloaded. Link is in the description below. Let's have a look at who today's guest is. Hello everybody, this is Stephen Allison. This is Elliot Hackney that's joining me from Bear Pit TV. This is The Warm Down. The Warm Down is now available on its own iTunes channel. So if you prefer to get all of the Just The Warm Down football chat, then go to iTunes or whatever you use to download your podcast. Go and download it and just listen to it on here. So yes, as I said, delighted to be joined by Elliot. Manchester United played Stoke at the Bet365. I still want to call it the Britannia, mate. I don't know about you. Yeah, and same. I... Exactly the same. <laughs> but Britannia was a sponsor as well, wasn't it? Exactly, but it just feels it's got you know just a different vibe to the name, you know, letters and numbers. Nah, not about it. So obviously, United. We're going to be obviously talking about United and uh, Stoke this weekend. For me, coming away, it feels like a loss from United this time around. Um, I watched quite a bit of you guys in the build-up as my part of my pre-analysis, and I I thought Chopo Monting, Chupo Monting, Chapo Monting, whatever the guy's called. I don't know. I say it either. I thought he was the yeah, threat he, against Arsenal. He was taking up good positions. He was looking like the one that was most likely to cause some sort of damage. And obviously, as we saw, when he came up against United, he was putting those away. Yeah, he was. And, you know, he, he's come here and he's not a goal scorer. He's not a prolific goal scorer. He wasn't for Schalke. He, he, he hasn't seemed to be for, for Schalke in his past couple of seasons. He's never moved on a permanent fee. He's always moved everywhere for a free transfer. But, you know, he was just at the races at the weekend and um, he, he put in a, a brilliant display. And it was shot, it was a bit of a shock because he was awful the previous week at West Brom. Wasn't in the game. He was getting knocked off easily and just didn't look like he was up to much. So I was not expecting him to get a double at the he's, weekend. He's a big unit as well, isn't he? But he doesn't play like what you would, in your head, call a typical Stoke big unit sort of centre forward. He plays like a, a lot smaller, more skillful kind of guy, doesn't he? He's almost like yeah, a yeah. Ten, if you like. Yeah, no, definitely. He, he's very light on his feet, and that, that's what happened at West Brom because he, he's such a different style of big player. He just didn't suit a physical Tony Pulis game, and he was just getting knocked off, and he was going down way too easy. And that's that's why I thought, I don't know if this guy can cut it in the Premier League, you know, the physicality of it. But then this weekend he showed he, he probably can. Against Arsenal, you was leaving all of those free forward players up front. Uh, Hesse, Shakiri, I think is absolutely class. I can't think he's going to be staying around at Stoke for too much longer, to be honest. I think you're going to really struggle keeping hold of him. Uh, Chapo Monting as well. All three of you, them guys was left forward as part of a counter, and that really caused Arsenal a load of problems, didn't it? Against United, you didn't do that. You, you completely sat back, made it narrow, made it tight, made it difficult for us. What do you reckon the reasons behind that was? And, and do you consider it a success getting a draw there or was you like, was you going for the win as well? Um, I think we had chances to win it. I mean, David De Gea made a, a brilliant save yeah. from Hesse when we were when it was 2-1 and then you know we could have gone and got another. But I'm, I'm more than happy uh, with the draw. I'd take, you know, you look at that fixture, you take a point ahead of, ahead of it being played, you'd snap your hand off for a point. But yeah, it was, you know, it, it was not like the Arsenal game where you know we had 22% possession, percent possession and we still managed to win we had a backs to the wall we were in, in this game a bit more if you know what I mean and one of our key signings this summer has been Darren Fletcher you, you'll know a lot about and he was brilliant in the middle of the park absolutely brilliant he's brought a different sort of level uh, to the Stoke Central midfield after we got rid of Glenn Whelan you've cut out Stephen mate I've lost you. You've Are you back? Proper. I've got I've got you back now. I lost you when you said. Um, fucking hell! I've remembered it now. Forgot it. Uh, it's not like I think you said, and then it it went. Um, Jesus, what was that about? Do we go back to the question? Yeah, just go back to answer that. Yeah. Um. Oh God, what was the question? You asked about. Um, was you happy with the result? Was it? I think. Was you? Or was you going for the win? Was it? I think. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to that. 
I mean, yeah, we, you know, you see that fixture on paper and you take a draw against Man United just a bit before it being played. But, you know, we did have some chances. Hasse had a big chance against David De Gea. Um, and, you know, we, this wasn't the typical game like against Arsenal. We had a backs to the wall, 22% possession. We were actually in this one a little bit. And one of our key signings of the summer, it seems, is a guy you'll know a lot about, and that's Darren Fletcher. He was brilliant in the middle park, and he has been since he since he arrived. And, you know, we had that captain's armband on, and he played like it. He played like a captain. He played like someone who's been at Stoke for years. And he was just spraying the ball wide to Mama Jufa. I think they picked up on it on match of the day the other night. And that was our key, uh, key sort of route. And... Uh, way we wanted to play and that's where the first goal came from but yeah I can't, I can't um, give Testament enough to how good Darren Fletcher has been since he's come For me when I did my analysis after the game I, I sort of hammered Paul Pogba a little bit because his positioning was like central and right rather than on the left and Pre-game, I said I wanted to see United line up with a midfield three with Pogba on the left and either Rashford or Marshall. I said Marshall obviously ended up being Rashford, but there's, there's nothing between them really. On that left-hand side, going for two v ones against Diouf because he's a fucking centre forward. Like you've got a, a centre forward playing right wing back. That's the obvious weak link in that Stoke side for me in a defensive sense. You get round him and then you, you threw on um, it's Chamber Chamber is it Chamberlain Cameron? No, it's Cameron. It Jeff Cameron Jeff on that Cameron. right-hand side, and you think. There, for me, would, would have been the, the place to create space for Manchester United. And we didn't do it once. He had three tackles to make uh, Diouf. One was against Damian, who went solo against him. Uh, one was against Mkhitaryan in the last ten minutes or so. And one was against Marshall, just before Marshall bodied him with that nutmeg. And you think, why have United not targeted that? For me, that was the most obvious place to attack you guys. 100%. Uh, Mama Juf is by no means a right wing back. I don't know if he's really a striker either. You know, he hasn't been doing great up top. But Mama Juf is by far the weakest point on our side, and we were desperate to get a right wing back in, a proper right wing back in this transfer window. We didn't do it. And it looks like Mark Hughes get, is going to stick with Mama Juf. Uh, we saw his weaknesses against Arsenal. There were some sloppy tackles. He nearly gave away what well, should have given away a penalty to Ballerin. Uh, and he's, he's, that's just definitely not his position. He, the, you, the, you see Mamadou Juf doing well when he set up the goal, you know, much higher up the pitch and doing things you'd expect from an attacker. He can't be trusted at right back. And like you say, you guys definitely should have exploited oh, that more. Was, I was pulling my hair out with it because I was like, we keep going down this right-hand side. Now, Valencia is obviously going to be more attacking than Damien is. That makes sense. But why, why is Pogba being dragged over there? Why is Rashford being so central? And you just think... We didn't play in that left-hand channel, or your, your right-hand channel, at all. And, and you think, oh, OK, we probably had the, the chances to win the game. It was two defenses error, defensive errors that led to the two goals. You can say that about every single goal that gets scored in the Premier League. The, it, the chances were there for both teams, but it just feels like we could have had so much more space. And it's easier to find space across the rest of the pitch when you're, when you're spread out as well. If you've... If you're just hammering one side, it's easy to stay in one side and defend against it, isn't it? I mean, um, going back to Darren Fletcher, I think Darren Fletcher and Joe Allen have got the basis of a really solid Premier League midfield. Do you think you need a little bit of extra spark with those, or do you think you get it with uh, like Hesse and Shakiri ahead of them? Uh, yeah, I think Mark uses set up so that we have this front three are all sort of quite maverick players in your Hesse, your Chupa Motingi, Shaq. And I think he's just happy to go and leave them to do the attacking, that three, and just leave them probably a bit disconnected from the midfield and the back five with the wing backs. Mm -hmm. I think that's how Mark Hughes has gone and how he's happy to set up. And he'll leave the, that to the front three to have the flair and to have uh, you know that sort of play. And I think he showed that in getting rid of Bojan. He's happy now to have a midfield four of uh, Jeff Cameron, Joe Allen, Fletcher and Charlie Adam as backup. And it looks like he's going to be rotating those guys throughout throughout the, the, the season after he got rid of Mbula as well. He was one of those more flair players who he, Mark Hughes feels like he couldn't seem to trust. So yeah, I think that is going to be our solid um, mid, midfield, you know, quite an experienced midfield in Joe Allen and Fletcher. But yeah, he's just happy to let that front three go and do what they like, really. Forgetting about the front three for a sec, what's your thoughts on having a back three? Um, I like it. After we've made it... Uh, a lot more get with the signing of Kevin Wimmer we've now got much more options there if player. last season yeah when last season when we were trying it we didn't have any cover for if anyone was injured there was no other option but a back but four to choose from out Shawcross Wimmer Bruno and Kurt Zuma you know that's that's a great back four to choose from for, for to make up that back three you've also got Jeff Cameron as backup who played in the first half so yeah I'm, I'm more than happy with it the only thing that I'd like us to have is stronger wing backs. You know, Eric Peters it hasn't had a great last season and he's he's not been great yeah, at the start shit. of this season. <laughs> yeah, and, and then we've got and then we've got Juf on the other side. So yeah, I'd, 
I'd be much more comfortable if we had some proper experienced wing backs. Um, I'd loved us to go and got, got Kieran Gibbs, who West Brom went, West Brom went for. But yeah, un unfortunate as it is, we've just got to stick with Eric Peters and Mamadou until at least January. West Brom have made some good signings, actually. And the middle of that Premier League, I'd say yourselves, West Brom, Everton. Are Arsenal going to get dragged into that as well, actually, because they've not been picking up a lot of points against that sort of team. What do you consider success for you guys this season? Uh, success for us is a top off finish to get back in there and also a good cup run. You know, the reason there was so much um, so much fury around Mark Hughes last season and even myself, I wanted him gone at the end of the season is because we not only didn't compete in the middle of the league where we should and we finished at 14th, but we also went out in the first stage of both cups, which is, is unacceptable. You know, fans of us mid-table teams, we live for the cups. You know, that, that that's what that's our chance of winning something. And to go out so early and to you know, both at home, Hull at home and Wolves at home, who are now both in the championship. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that is, it's games you're expected to win, isn't it? It's, and when exactly, you don't win games exactly. you expect to win, then obviously you're right. To, you're every right to be pissed off, aren't you, regardless of your level. You've gone again, Halston. Are you back? Just fucking lost check. <laughs> uh, so I just said, um, yeah, you've every right to be pissed off when you, 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 you're drawn against teams that you're expected to win. You're supposed to win those games, aren't you, regardless of the level? Yeah, exactly. I mean, especially when they're at home as well. And now, you know, this season, this is why I think so many Stoke fans feel so much more positive is Mark Hughes doesn't usually get a win until seven, eight games into the season. You know, we've, already got, we've already got one and a couple of points from draws, but we've also got through to the next round of the cup and we've also got an easy tie in the net. Well, you say easy, it's Bristol City away. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not, e no game's ever easy, but you know, it's one that we'd hope, we think we should win. So yeah, we, there's a lot more of a positive atmosphere around Stoke this season and success for us would be a, a, a decent cup run. You know, we got came so close a couple of years ago Liverpool got knocked out on penalties in the semi-final and I think everyone's just itching for something like that again just just if we could get to one final we'd love that well yeah I mean and, and I don't understand why a lot of the mid-table teams don't really seem to take the EFL Cup the Carabao Cup the League Cup the Kim Milk Cup whatever it's called this this week why they don't really seem to take it that serious <laughs> they're, they're generally going to be safe in the league so they've not got to worry about Oh, if we concentrate on this, it's going to leave us getting relegated. I don't think that's the case for a lot of the mid-table teams. And you, you see how Hull City was you know, pushing us really close in there last year. They they could have knocked us out if they just had a little bit more quality about them. And th you've got a Wembley final then, haven't you? Regardless of what competition it is. You've seen Southampton, how seriously they took it. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's the sort of thing fans live for. You know, that one day or that, especially as mid-table teams. You know, you you they've got to have something. We're not we're not expecting to go and do a Leicester and win the league. You can't you can't even hope for anything like that. You you can't even hope for a top six. You can't even hope for top six or anything like that nowadays. Or seventh, eighth. Those positions are, you've got to spend so much money to compete in those positions. So you've got to live for those cups. You've got to throw everything into those. And Mark Hughes last season in the, the FA Cup third round, we played a weakened side, and it, it just came back to bite him on the ass. On that, then, because I think that's really interesting. Cause I'm going to Bilbao next week uh, to go and talk to some of them and do a little bit of a video on what makes Bilbao so special and how they're able to maintain that competitive edge. Uh, they're one of three teams that haven't been relegated from La Liga uh, alongside Barcelona and Real Madrid, unsurprisingly. They they hamstring themselves with this Basque-only policy uh, that they have, which in recent years I think has been extended to grandparents uh, rather than just being born or trained in the Basque region as a youngster, uh, which is what it used to be. But with that sort of hamstringing that they've got, that sort of handicap that they give themselves, they've managed to attain top five, top six finishes in La Liga on a regular basis. Why don't you think more clubs in England don't accept? Because, let's face it, if Bilbao wanted to get to the next level, it's going to cost them billions. Literally billions, isn't it? You can't break into that top three in Spain. I wouldn't have thought. So, no. success for Bilbao is going to be, like you said, good cup runs, maybe the occasional um, Copa del Rey, finishing in a Champions League spot, absolutely fantastic for them. Why don't you think there's more clubs in England, like maybe yourselves, maybe the likes of Everton, Southampton, or they, they do it to an extent. Why don't you think there's more clubs like that who are going, do you know what, we can't fucking get into the Champions League the way the league is set up with the, the financial doping that we're seeing that United are guilty of as well. But at what point does Everton say, when you see transfers like Neymar going for 200 million, when you see 
Mbappe going for 150 million. At what point did they go? Do you know what? If we spent 150 million on our academy, if we spent all this sort of money on actually developing players from six, seven years of age, then you've got a business model, haven't you? Because some of them players can get sold. They can fund other transfers. You you can have an organic club. If Bilbao can do it with the the level of hamstringing that they give themselves, then surely it can be done elsewhere around the world. But why don't you think it happens in the Premier League? And I think it's too much of a risk over a, such a long period. You know, to implement it, it's got to. It, it, you don't see. The, you don't reap the reward, so to say, for what eight, ten years when these youngsters are coming through. When from when you're putting it in, you know, and we know the Premier League is all about money. It's all about staying there. It's all about owners making profit these days. So I just think the the risk involved from scrapping a model like Everton, where they're going out and buying players now and spending a lot of money, to go and put that into the academy, they're just not going to benefit those rewards in the short term. And you know. Fans, fans, fans. We see, we've seen today. We've seen from uh, Debo getting sacked after four games. It's also immediate now. You, you, every for everyone wants success straight away. And for for a club to go and say, right, we're going to go and do this model and say, say it was Everton, we're going only going to take players, young players from Liverpool and develop well, there. You don't, they don't have to take it to that level. I mean, I'm just talking about being an organic academy, so they, they can take them from Europe anywhere in England. I just mean, just like, build your own because when an average player is going for forty million quid. You've got to go, hang on, is it not cheaper? Is it not easier to just bring some fucking players through, pay for the best coaching in the world so you've got and have a system where they're coming into the first team? We must be really close to where that's more financially viable than signing some fucker is. I think you've gone again, Halsey. <laughs> All right, I just said... Um, we must be really close to the tipping point now where instead of signing a player for 30, 40, 50 million, it's got to be more financially prudent and sensible and actually easier to just sign someone, uh, to just promote someone and, and grow your own players. Like, surely. You've got to have the right coach in place, I guess, as well. I mean, you look at Pochettino, who's brilliant at you know working with young talent. And could you say that Everton or a Southampton have got that manager to do that? I'm not so sure. Everton have... seem to have it now, though. They've got... Four or five, I think, young lads in the squad that they're giving games to at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got Adam Edel Lutman, you've got some of the lads at the back who are doing pretty well. Uh, but uh, again, it's, I, I just don't think they're willing to take that risk. The, the such the long term risk. You know, they, they are, when they when you can promote, um, it's you know it's great to see and it's great to see a, a young lad coming through and the fans really really love that. And to bring it back to Stoke again, which I hate to keep doing, but that's fine. That's why we got you on. We haven't had a youngster come through since Ryan Shotton in 2011, who uh, is now at Birmingham. I think he, actually, I think he's just had a transfer. But we haven't had a youngster come through like that, that a local lad or someone that we developed for quite some time. The most recent one is Julian Ngoy from Belgium, uh, and he's he's made one sub appearance in the Premier League. Um, Isn't that sad though? Yeah, honestly, I think it is. I think for a Premier League club, we should be producing a lot more. We've actually put money into our facilities as well. We've now got Clayton Wood from when we were. Uh, you know, before we were come working out of like trailers on a on a field, what you know back in the day, but you know, it, it's just what we can produce, it, and it's down again. It's down to the manager. I don't think Mark Hughes trusts youth that well, so there's not much that can that can be done when you've got a manager like that in place. Like you say, a lot, it, it does come down to the manager and the whole setup, the infrastructure, and some clubs will have that in place and that philosophy, and some just won't. The the, the two. Too focused on the immediate successes and but just staying in the Premier League. That immediate success doesn't even seem to be happening for anybody at the moment, either apart from those at the top. And unless some of them are considering success another year in the Premier League, another year in the Premier League, another year in the Premier League, that doesn't feel like success to me. I think you could be happy, um, and I certainly would be happy with you. your expectations change, don't they? And I'm pretty sure my expectations now as a United fan would have, are so different to what they would have been. If I was my same, the same age as I am 25, 30 years ago, I would have had a, a massively different set of expectations. I think the expectation level of fans changes through the dips and troughs that you go in. Manchester City fans right now are so spoiled over the last few years that they'd be fucking devastated if they finished outside the top four. But they need to remember that. They're, you know, they're a rich Wigan Athletic, and that's what the top and bottom of it is for them, isn't it? <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. It's one way, to, one way to put it, yeah. I mean, but, you know, Man City have this... Um, sort of break down every year when they go out of the Champions League in the early stages and they just expect better but at the minute English clubs just 
aren't up there in competing with the rest of Europe. And like you say, going back to Bilbao, Real Madrid and a, a couple of other Barcelona, they 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 do bring youth through. You you see the youth like Asensio coming through for Real Madrid. Barcelona brings some good kids through every now and then. They've got La Masia system, which is absolutely brilliant. But again, I don't know if they put enough trust in all those youngsters. There's some talents in those academies that just need a bit more exposure to first team football. But it's just whether the bosses are going to be willing to do that when their job is on the line. Yeah, and I think that is the problem. Is that I see the massive culture that you see at the moment in football is is one of where everyone's afraid to lose the job, uh, and I think that needs to change. When I look back at the 60s, and I like reading a lot of football history and stuff like that, and when I look back at that era of the 60s, you see Matt Busby wasn't winning back-to-back -back titles. You see all of these greats at Liverpool, Shanklin, now, they weren't winning back-to-back -back titles very often. And it was sort of accepted that you could win the title one year, challenge for it the next, maybe win a cup the next year, maybe get a title the year after. But that's not good enough in the modern Premier League. And, and for me, it probably should be. You can't be successful year in, year out. So Alex Ferguson wasn't successful year in, year out. And he was hyper successful. And there were times that we wouldn't win the league. And it felt like from 2004, 2005, 2006, when Arsenal and Chelsea was winning the league, it felt like we was a long way off. But we still kept with him. And you think, mm. would we have kept with him if he hadn't won a treble? Like, if you look around at what's going on around their place now, I mean, I thought it was an absolute joke that Ranieri lost his job. And I don't care if they were rock bottom of the league. The guy just won the fucking league with Leicester. He should have been able to fucking change the colours of the ground if he wanted to. Like, he should have been allowed to do anything. He's earned the right to take them down and bring them back up for me. They should have statues of him. They yeah, should have a statue of him outside the ground. They should have a fucking statue of him, yeah. Him and that Chris Beating guy. I mean, it says it all with... I mean, I think it's just the way the world's going. Social media now, everyone, immediate success. There's so much pressure from the, the, the press, like the traditional press. Sometimes the the, like the new media, even us with the fan channels, you have some people on fan cams, etc., really giving some opinions out there that are you know, affecting a lot of people's judgment. But you see, it's, you see it with De Boer. They brought him in to change their style of football and change their philosophy and the way they're playing. And what? It's gone after... He's gone after four games. That's it. Four. 77 bastard days he's been in charge. And the, the gaffer Parish was coming in and saying, we're going to go a new way. We're going to do this. And that, Palace have had a massive turnover of managers in the last few years. So you're looking at a guy who's there with a squad that's not his. They didn't spend anything at all, I don't think, in the summer. They got a few players in on loan. And that they've been their better players so far. So the squad's, one, obviously not good enough. Two, somebody else's thing that they put together. And in 77 days... What the fuck can you do? I doubt you could decorate your house in 77 days, to be honest. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? How can you expect yeah. the whole philosophy of a football club to change direction and to start working and all the kinks behind out of it in the hyper-competitive world of the Premier League? I'm absolutely sick of people not being given a decent opportunity. I'm sick of it, man. Like, it, it does my fucking head in. Is it, how's how's De Boer supposed to play Ajax style football or Ajax philosophy after with, inheriting with Sam Allardyce's Allardyce squad? Team, like, literally, it's going to take honestly, time. Honestly. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time. And I mean, Steve Parrish has shot himself in the foot as well because he put a tweet out, was it last night or the two, uh, night yeah, yesterday, before, saying we're, we're a group, we're a collective. Yeah. We're, we're like, going we to go forward to together. <laughs> yeah. not, not Frank, no. Frank, Frank's ne not coming. Next, <laughs> next day is gone. Next day is gone. Absolutely ridiculous. And it's just the, 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 the way that the Premier League is at the moment. We, we don't know what's coming from one day to the next. I'm bringing Roy Hodgson in, right? Who started his managerial career 41 years ago. What are you going to get there? He's going to probably get some results out of that team straight away just through the fact that he's got man-managing experience. But is he going to bring this new style of play? Or is he going to be a guy in for nine months and then he's out the fucking door as well? What the fuck can you yeah. expect people to do? In that's, what, that's exactly what it's going to be. Roy Hodgson will come in, he'll probably keep them up or you know, just guide them to a safety and a real success and then he'll be gone again. He's I mean, 71, man. He's 70 fucking one. I know Sam Allardyce has just said on MNF as well. He said that Steve Parrish gave him a call, like he was ready to have Big Sam back, but Big Big Sam said no. I mean that says it all. He just just he's got just got rid of the man. You've just the ended the transfer left. window a week ago. That is not the time to start bringing anybody in because they've got they've got to now piss with the cock that you've given, which is the one that clearly wasn't good enough for the last guy that was there. And they had so many shots yesterday. They they look like they're progressing. They don't look like a team that's bereft of ideas, totally out, totally lost. The results are shocking, but the performances they were, they weren't, weren't the, that bad. Yeah, they were they weren't the worst side yesterday. They were no. the better side, and you know it, it all came down to Scott Dan in the last minute. He's missed a header two yards out. If that goes in, he keeps his job. 
Simple yeah, more than likely, yeah, more than likely. And that's, that is the fine margins of football, that's the fine margins of success. We wouldn't be talking about United losing or drawing or whatever this weekend with Stoke. If, um, if Phil Jones keeps his composure, if Bayi steps up and plays uh, Hesse offside, like, that is the fine margins of football. I mean, literally. Uh, you know, John Terry doesn't slip over and, and hit the crossbar. Chelsea become European champions in 2008. That is the fine margins of sport, and that's why we fucking love it. But ultimately, exactly. yeah, there's got to be some sort of common sense applied at some point, somewhere. You'd, you'd think, but, you know, these people running football clubs these days aren't, aren't sane people, aren't normal people. They're, they're just... You see some of the examples of owners at the minute. You, you don't wonder how the hell they've passed the fit and proper person's task because the, the majority of them are absolutely nuts. Like the whole owner, uh, other people that you've seen come in, Cardiff owner, they're, 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 not, they're, not, they're not real, you know, sort of real people that expect what coming into a club means to, to the fans of that club. They're just, some of them are absolute nut jobs and just go about the business like it's a toy. And, and, and it's not, it's people's lives and people support these clubs and put, spend a lot of money, time and effort supporting them. And it's it's a sad state for football sometimes. There's a, there's a lot of really shoddy managers and shoddy owners in there. When you look at what's going on at Newcastle, that guy's yeah. just constantly rinsing their best players, uh, making an embarrassment of themselves in the media and... You look at what's going on with West Ham and you think, honestly, I've never run a football club. I reckon I'd do a better fucking job than they're doing at West Ham. Definitely would. Give us the money. We'll do it. <laughs> I'll go down and run a club. I, I mean, it, I reckon. We, 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 I, think, I feel like Stoke City are quite spoiled. We have one of the best chairmen in football in our eyes. You know, We've got a local guy, runs a local company. Um, he, he's a fan of the club. We're not in any debt. They do things like pay for their away travel every season. Ticket Season ticket prices haven't rose since we got promoted. We have one of the best owners in football, and I think we're quite lucky with that. Well, I don't know your owner's name. That's probably a good thing. Peter Coates. Peter Coates. But isn't that a good thing? In The fact that he's not in the news, not making a fucking embarrassment of himself all the time, not involved in controversy in his fucking home country or whatever, or something along those lines... That's surely a good thing, and that's obviously the indicator is what you need. And that maybe we need more of that, more football men involved in football. Yeah, I mean, call me crazy, but more f- people who actually fucking like football. Uh, what's the crap with Bear Pit TV then? Because we've never seen one of your videos uh, hit Arsenal fan TV levels of viralness. Have you got no Muppets that come in and uh, chat and shit on that? Because we don't, do, we, we don't do it. No, no, I don't. I, I, I go by it a certain way, and it, it's never going to go viral. It's never going to. Uh, be on the front page of the internet because someone's done a dodgy interview because we don't really do them it's more just um a, 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 a place for people to come for news we have like tactic show uh, preview with other channels collabs um we have to do the podcast which is to go in pretty well but yeah we, we we don't do the 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 arsenal fan tv route so to say um, and it is only a small operation. It's only myself and a couple of other lads because we're not massive. You know, we're, 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 we've got an okay audience on Facebook, 30-odd thousand, and then fo- we're almost touching 4,000 subs. But, yeah, you'll never see us go viral. We, do, we I just like to make decent content and not uh, go for the viral and uh, sometimes, <laughs> what you'd say, maybe a detriment to the club route. It's not just that it's a detriment to the club as well. I think it's a, an unfair representation of the fan base a lot of the times. Although maybe that's not the case with Arsenal. But I, I think that... I, I agree with the way you guys do it. I, I, I do like to have more of a level-headed approach. And I don't like some of those viral rant-type things. It's unfortunate that that's um, seen as the, the end thing. But it doesn't generally go viral within a community. It, uh, within a supporter base does it it's generally other people laughing at it rather than your own fan base saying yeah I know Redman had, a, had one go viral within their own fan base because he was talking about how the club had become a bit of a tourist trap and stuff like that that mm. one was an example of one actually being quite a a positive negative if you like it was a yeah it was weird but it was it was something that that whole fan base really got hold of and got behind generally it's it's other fucking it's other fans Taking the piss in it, as we've seen mainly with Arsenal fan TV, which has just gone on its own. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I when I first started it, I, I had uh, some people come up to me straight away and they were like, "Don't go down the Arsenal fan TV route." And I think it's different with a club like Stoke because we're a lot tighter knit fan base. You know, we, we're not a, we're not a massive club compared to the, anyone in the top six. And um, everyone that I know through the Bear Pit TV. I'll have oft, often have conversations with. We'll see him at the ground, stop, have a nice chat about the football and. 
it's, it's weird. Like Stoke's a completely different fan base. A lot of people aren't willing to speak to the camera. We're, you know, we're quite uh, industrial sort of people, and it's it's completely different. We do we do well when we produce a good piece of content. Like we did a podcast with Matty Everton that was really good, really deep. Uh, he told us a lot of good stories. We've also done uh, interviews with Jack Butland and. You know, we hope to get more people on, but yeah, we, we more, I, I just prefer making good content that we put a lot of time and effort into instead of, you know, we can, we have done it previously. We have gone interview people outside the ground, but it's just not, just not my cup of tea, really. No, and I think, I, I don't even like doing the review that I do uh, yeah. immediately after the game. Because uh, when I look back, it, it's generally uninformed. Like I need to go and, and, and settle my thoughts. And at the moment I'm, Pretty much after a game, I'll do. I'll go and do a fan cam with Adam after the game if, if we're at home or whatever, and um, and then the day later or whatever, I'll actually re-watch the game and I'll make notes and I'll actually look at what happened and, and then give like a tactical analysis of, of what's actually happened. But mm. those two videos can have a completely different outlook most of the time because there's things that you're not seeing in the ground that you've got the benefit of a replay of. And, you know, there's all of those sort of things. I I would prefer to be able to to at least go away for an hour before ever having to talk about what I've just seen. I, I get that you get the raw it's emotion, the house, and sometimes that is interesting content. I just think you get a bit more better content after you've had an hour to digest what you've just seen rather than what you've just witnessed. I think eyewitness testimony is you know notoriously unreliable, isn't it? Although it does make for some funny shit occasionally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, we had a sh we had a show that I wish we still did, and we had um, a local pub after after the game, and we went back there and did a live stream. Four of us sat on the table having a pint, and we actually had you know I've got my iPads, but we're taking comments from people after the game and just a little sort of review. But it was interactive. I used to really love doing that. It's a shame we still don't because we we don't go to that pub uh, really anymore. <laughs> but that sort of stuff's what I prefer to make a lot of things that are interactive, maybe a live stream, whatever, that's a bit more composed where you've had time to collect your thoughts, as you say, after the game where a bit more thought's gone into it and just just some really good content. But like I say, you know, we're, we're not the biggest fan channel, so, you know, don't matter, we, mate. You're we in, can't you're do too much. You're in the fucking race and that's all that matters. Like, where do you see fan-generated content going? Because I, I think with... I, I don't think there's, we're going to see... Like, I don't think we're going to have all of the social networks that we've got now. I don't think are going to survive. And I don't think we're going to only have all the ones that we've got now. There's clearly going to be other things that pop up. There's clearly going to be other things that get involved. Where do you see the, the future of fan TV going? Because the barrier to entry is virtually non-existent at the moment. For people in a first world country like England, if you've got a smartphone, you can be a YouTube creator. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And you see them popping up all the time. I see new fan channels be, be, being a part of the Ball Street Network that we are. We see new ones joining all the time. People joining in with different fan channels. You see Huddersfield have come up this season. I've seen a rise in Huddersfield fans that I didn't even know exist. And that's the, you know, like you say, it's so simple to get involved. I think that in the future, it may go the way where all these fan channels are maybe under one social platform. I think that, would, you know, YouTube seems to be on the decline at the minute. And with what happened yesterday with PewDiePie, probably well, everyone's had revenue will suffer even further. But um, yeah, for me in the future, I could see a Premier League fan network, potentially, I'm not too sure, um, where everyone's plugged into the same base. There is one maybe, not official, but one channel for each club specifically. And for me, that you know, it's not, that's not a bad thing. You know, it gives a lot of fans a chance to connect with each other. There, there could be uh, more things like tournaments, like, having matches against each other and all that sort of thing, which everyone seems to love to do. Me, myself, I love I love doing that as well, playing the Next Level Football League as, against Hashtag and all those guys. Oh, which so, yeah, I play for London City with oh, the front three with boys. Oh, you fucking Statman Widge and all them lot? Yeah, it was Statman Dave, <laughs> Statman Dave, Laws, Adam Boltwood, all the fellas. Um, but yeah, we're, we're doing okay in that. And the more things like that, I, I, I think are, are a good step in the right direction. I like that sort of stuff. Now, we was involved in that Fan League Cup that they had uh, yeah. July, was it? I think it was yeah. July. Uh, and I thought that was really good. It was really well run. Um, it had a lot of production had gone into it. Like, King Loz was running around with like 16 different cameras, with the pitch <laughs> and everything. And, and the production that came out of those was excellent. It was really good. Like, the, the, the comments that we've had from people about wanting to get involved and, and having a team 
to come and play for full time. It was great, and I really enjoyed having a team down there. And I think we did it the right way. We had subscribers there, we had presenters there, we had a couple yeah. of our mates there, and we had a fucking good day out. Like I've still got the suntan on my hand from the uh, from the day it was that bleeding up. And, and I do agree that they're gonna have uh, a bit of a part to play going forward. For me, fan channels are just fanzines with newer technology. That is it. Uh, there's the top and bottom of it. Fanzines have existed for thirty or so years, and I think. YouTube and this, that, and the other, and blogs. It's just the evolution of fans having an opinion and talking about football uh, and creating content that people clearly want to consume. Um, I saw something the other day which was talking about. It was talking about hashtag and Rebel FC and the, this sort of stuff, mm. and it got me thinking. Like my lad watches United, and he has a bit of a passing interest in the likes of hashtag and stuff like that, uh, and he's eleven. And I wonder how many other 11, 12, 13 year olds, particularly those that are a little bit isolated, you're living a little bit of a like a weird town that doesn't have a massive club attached to it or something like that. Are they going to be more attracted to following the likes of Hashtag with the the personalities and the personalities that they're building in those teams rather than... I don't, I don't think the Premier League misses out. I think there's always going to be a market for Premier League teams. But do you think like tier 6 to 10, like you know, Conference North and below... Do you think they're going to struggle to attract players and the, you're going to see them, or players and fans, and do you think you're going to start seeing them playing for the likes of Hashtag and that? Definitely. I could see I could see something like that going. I mean, with, with Hashtag and the teams you see on the internet, there's that much more personality involved and relativity to, to those channels. I mean, you, you, the videos that Spencer puts out and also, as you say, the Rebel FC guys, and now Arsenal Fan TV have got their own team. When, when people start introducing that, introducing more content... Um, there's there's more content there than they're getting from their their actual club. Oh yeah, by I mean, a long way. I mean, uh, exactly. And I I see hash, the content that hashtag United are putting out. Stoke City don't put out that much content. Yeah, can you imagine? It's still there. I we don't feel we don't feel that connect to our Premier League players at the moment. They're these movie star millionaires that arrive in the ground with security. They go out, we play, we, pen, we spend a fucking fortune to watch them. They jump on a bus afterwards, sign two, three autographs, and they're fucking out the door. Like that is the Premier League at the moment, and the the interaction and the connection between players and fans is almost non-existent. Whereas YouTube is built on the back of personalities, and when you've got people like you're, like you said, listening to, talking to days and days and hours and hours every fucking month and you, you feel connected to them people way more than a guy that you listen to like, look at the fucking interviews that you see Premier League players doing after the game they don't want to be there the people interviewing them tossing them the shittest questions ever ah oh, so you just won 5-0 you scored all 5 goals how does that feel? yeah and they just, and they just come out with a recited PR answer and uh, you don't, yeah you, you know don't get it feels alright it's all about the lads um, so you couldn't have done it without them you clearly could have just scored 5 goals like Where's the personality? Where's where's it like coming out like yeah? I just put my dick on the table, scored five goals. Who's better than me? Get the fuck out of my face! Like, how fucking great would it be to have someone? Because you know that's what they're thinking in the red. And it, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, honesty, honesty would be a lot more, a lot, a lot better. And you know, it help us connect to those players more and probably put more into supporting the club or st supporting that player on the pitch or if they're ever messing up or doing badly. You know, we, we'd have much more of a connection, but. You know, this, it's just so PR trained at the minute and the clubs want to protect their brand uh, so much that we're just not going to see it in this day and age. It's not going to happen. No, it's sad. That, I think that whenever you see someone who does something a little bit wrong, because the press needs news, and we live in a 24-hour news society where people have got to have content all the time that they can talk about, that they can analyse to death, that anything that a player does that's not, like, perfectly in line with Premier League regulations or club code of conducts and stuff like that, they get fucking hammered. Especially those mm. at the top six clubs. You get absolutely scrutinised to death and it's front page news and you're just like, can't you just be a bit of a dickhead sometimes? Because we're all fucking dickheads at the end of the day, aren't we? Every single fucking one of us. Well, at some points, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, not 24-7. Not, not, we're not all the time. Moments. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. We'd just like to see them be a bit more human. Yeah, that's it. Just, yeah, because th that disconnect, I think, is ultimately going to be the downfall of the Premier League. 
because they're going to keep pushing the price and pushing the price and pushing the price and they could probably double it and they're still going to have a large amount of people there because it's such a spectacle that everybody wants to go and watch but you're going, to, you're going to lose a lot of that connection if you do that and you're going to have a lot more people that are coming just for that one game you're going to have a, a totally different sort of crowd and I, I can I can honestly see a lot of that crowd moving towards League One, League Two maybe not certain elements of the crowd moving towards like YouTube leagues and stuff like that as fan bases but how does the average 12, 13 year old whose old man doesn't take him to the match how do they start to connect to a football club? They're way more likely to connect to this guy that they're subscribed to on YouTube and they, they watch him and he's got, you know, they're one of three million other subscribers that the guy's got and you know, this guy's got a team, oh, they're coming to play in my local fucking football club and the tickets are a fiver, I'm going to go mm. like Football clubs are going to fuck themselves with uh, with the attitude and the, the way they treat fans at the moment. That and that's a big bugbear of mine. That they are hundred percent. I mean, I, I can't see why. I mean, because obviously I work in social media. I can't see why a club yet hasn't gone out there and sort of acted on this and made their own, say, fan team as a YouTube series. You know, they've got the, they've got the capability to do so. They've got the they've got all the mate. They've got a team got... already. They just need to go and treat it like that. Can you imagine if they yeah. we had this 10 second interaction with players as they're walking onto the training ground? How's that feel? How'd you feel today? Oh, I've got a bit of a sore, whatever. You know, or, you know, we see that laugh and joking because we know it happens. You can see it on the players' own social media accounts, on Snapchat and Instagram mm -hmm. sometimes. That little bit of banter and back and forth that they've got, but then whenever someone puts a camera in front of them for Sky or for the club or anything like that, it's stone face media train time, Freeze. isn't it? And that's, that's bollocks, man. Yeah, it is. It's just the way it's gone now, and it's it's a shame, really. I mean, when you look back at uh, the like interviews from the '90s or from a, a while ago before that, and when the guys would go to the pub, you know, they used to go to the pub after the games and, and be <laughs> with fans. You know, it's it's just just not like that anymore, and it's a shame, really. Professionalism wise, yeah, it's gone absolutely down the toilet in terms of like going out and on, going on a session. Do you listen to the Magic Spoon podcast? No. Oh. Don't, I'm going to send you a link and you're going to listen to every single one of them right? by weekend. They're fucking <laughs> phenomenal. I think it helps because Jimmy Bullard's clearly a bellend in a good way. Like in a really good way. Yeah. Like if he was one of your mates, he'd be one of your funniest mates because he generally doesn't give a flying fuck. And it's entertainment 101. So when he sits down with another ex-pro, all they mm. want to do is tell him about the times that he was fucking about because that's the, the energy that he gives off, in it? That he's just constantly fannying about. So... <laughs> every single person that they've had on all they do is they talk about the stories where they got caught doing this and they got caught doing that Ray Parler talking about nearly getting arrested with Tony Adams and stealing from Pizza Hut and things like that and you think you've got character there's all these characters in the dressing room they're not all these like boring ass Michael Owen sort of characters we know that these people are, are existing in these dressing rooms yeah 100% I mean and we we don't uh, we don't get that out of them until they retire. I mean, the prime example is Matty Everton when he came on our podcast. He finally unearthed a story that Stoke fans have been waiting for for like four or five years. That happened the whole pig head scandal that happened at Stoke, and we all, we only actually found out what happened because he was willing to speak about it once he'd retired. And it's like, why can't we just have this story four or five years ago? Because it's absolutely brilliant, and it just it just never just never materialised while they were playing now because they're like you know like I say they just want to protect the brand. That's it, it's the brand, it's the sponsorship, you're going to lose sponsors if you say that. Now we're not asking people to come out and say anything bangers like Andre Gray did, not asking for anything that's going to get you in actual trouble, but just show us that you're a fucking regular guy that just happens yeah. to be pretty good at football, it's not too much to ask I don't think. Yeah, no, definitely not, I mean, a good example at the minute of someone who does seem to be doing that on their social media accounts is Benjamin Mendy at Man City. He's yeah, doing, he does actually, you know, he's, yeah. he's, He's showing himself as a bit of a human. He's been quite funny on Twitter. He's taking the piss out of himself and sometimes other players. And that's good to see. It's good to see a personality like that. Mishi, Mishi Batshua has been doing it as well for a while now. Those two are pretty good on social media. It's good to see someone. You're sort of taking that by, by, the, by the scruff of the net, really, and doing a bit. Just it's interacting weird. in some way with people. It's weird, because I know that you, do, you obviously work in social media with this sort of stuff as well. And it is... The, a sort of absolute minefield in terms of the sort of things that you can talk about, the sort of things that you want mm. to put out there, or what's brand safe and all that kind of shit. But you know what? Have you seen what like Wendy's is doing in America? The way yeah. that their Twitter account they reacts. absolutely smash it. Oh, it's, it's fantastic, isn't it? The way they they absolutely shut people down. Um, like 
someone started cussing him out and saying uh, like your breakfast ain't shit on McDonald's and all that lot. And the reply saying, "Why well, you got to bring them in it just because you're you like you fucking thick, basically." They're absolutely rinsing them, but yeah. they're doing it funny. They're doing it clean. They're not swearing at them, but they're, they're, they're rinsing them and they're showing they've got a personality. And that's probably, for me, it's better than just this constant send of utter bollocks. Interact with people for fuck's sake. When was the last time yeah. like, you saw a Premier League player, a top tier Premier League player, just have a back and forth with someone? Not someone calling them a cunt, because I can imagine that their inbox is like 90% people telling them that they're a cunt and the shit. I imagine that's mm. pretty hard to deal with. But like, when did you see them yeah. just having like a little bit of a back and forth? Like, oh, like thanks. They're like, oh, you played great today. Cheers. Like, yeah, not it never happens. Never really happens. I mean, we we've been, I think feel like Stoke City have been blessed for uh, on social media because we, some of our players are quite good. We've obviously had Hoof, John Walters. Hoof was playing cock or no cock. That was a brilliant example, by the way. <laughs> when Hoof played, cock, he got banned. For, he got banned for it. Um, but that that you know we've got a brilliant example there. We've had we've been blessed with some guys who are willing to do a bit. John Walters when uh, Sterling scored less gold, goals than him and went and demanded 120 grand week, a week and then Walters put the picture of him knocking on Marcus' door saying, where's my raise? And we've got, <laughs> Peter, we've got Peter Crouch as well. He's absolutely brilliant on Twitter, you know, obviously <laughs> putting pictures of himself with, with a pair of giraffes and saying that he is my mum and dad. <laughs> he, you know, he, he's uh, quite decent. So like I feel, I feel like... As well. Oh yeah, Crouch is absolutely brilliant. I've got no doubt that when he does ever hang up his boots, he's straight into the media game because he's so good and so funny and genuine. And that comes across with Crouchy. Yeah, I think he's just a really nice fucking dude, actually. Um, he gets he gets dog abuse everywhere he goes. People just shouting freak and does a circus. No, you're here and all that. He's a funny looking guy. But, you know, yeah. It is one of them, isn't it? I do think he has got a future in whatever he wants to fucking do. In. If he ever decides he needs to, I'm sure he doesn't fucking need to. No, I mean he was he was DJ on Radio X for the first two two weeks of preseason, and, and he was decent to be fair. I mean, <laughs> but it's just an example of what he what he's like. You see him crowd surfing at gigs. I I, I had a picture. Um, I, someone sent me a video uh, not too long ago, whilst they were still still all in the holidays in summer, and it was someone doing uh, limbo in um, the Isle of Wight festival. And then you just glance across to the person holding the limbo stick on the other side. And it's Peter Crouch. <laughs> Just playing a game of Limbo in Isle of Wight Festival. But it's just absolutely mental. Right, I'm going to wrap it up there because I need to get this shit edited and get it out. Uh, but thank you for joining us. Uh, go and check out if you want to see what the Stoke perspective on stuff is. Uh, i got a lot of neutrals on here, so um, hopefully we can grow up with a little bit of neutrals on yours as well. Go check out the Bear Pit TV. I will throw a link in the description as well, and Elliot on Twitter. Cheers well. for having us, mate. Cheers for joining us, mate. Uh, good little chat. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. As I said, the one down is now available on iTunes, so if you don't want to watch the videos, you can go and just listen to it and get on with your day. So that's just search the one down on iTunes and you will find it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in a bit. <laughs>